So our next, uh, our next presentation is um, something that I've actually been looking forward to. Um, two colleagues that I work with on a very regular basis. Um, I'm the Blackboard Administrator here at Lehman College. Um, uh, Natasha Nurse and uh, Miriam Cadet are going to do a presentation on building an effective Blackboard course. So I'm very excited to see this one. So I'd like to first thank Steve for inviting me to be here. This is a, this is a really great um, conference to be at. And I'm going to talk to you today about building an, an exemplary course. Uh, and the, the exemplary course program is something that was started by Blackboard, um, which is the online tool that we use here at Lehman. And I got interested in this for several reasons. Um, one is, as Marcy mentioned earlier, nursing is starting an, a completely online RN to BSN program. And the other is, um, I had the opportunity to work with a great program called the New York Connect program at Hunter College. And they all got me interested in optimizing online education. So this program that was developed by Blackboard has um, they're looking for best practices in four major areas. Their course design, interaction and collaboration, assessment and learner support. And I'm going to talk to you about each of these categories, some ideas for meeting their expectations, and a little bit about how I incorporated um, some of my ideas into meeting their expectations as well. So their, their course has subcategories. So I told you the four major categories. And then each of those categories have subcategories that are weighted and then are scored. And that's how they determine whether your course is exemplary or not. So the first section under course design is goals and objectives. So Blackboard wants to see that your goals and objectives are written clearly and they're very easily located. So I've just given an example from the Blackboard course that I'm building. Um, and it shows you here that the objectives are clearly stated and very easy to find for the students. This is another example of something that's easy to find, especially for a student if it's their first time taking an online course, and this is a completely online course. You may come onto Blackboard and you have no idea where to begin, where do you click, there's all these menu tabs and you're not sure what to do. So as an example, in this course, you can see uh, on the menu tabs it says, welcome, start here. So it's very intuitive, you know exactly where you're going that first day of class, and then going forward, I'll provide continued um, explanation about what the students should do. Another section is content presentation. Now, content presentation, again, has to be seamless. It has to be intuitive. So what I've done is developed um, modules that you can create in Blackboard. So it says week one, unit one, week two, unit two, so that the students know where to go. Um, I'm probably going to change this so it'll say uh, week one and the date because being a student also, I'm also a student at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I know once there's a break, once there's a holiday, I don't know what week of school we're in when I come back. So I'm probably going to do something like week one, September 1st through the 7th, or week two, September 8th through whatever, so that the students can find their way. Again, this is another way of just being seamless, making it easy for students, not giving them an excuse to say, I didn't know what to do, I wasn't sure. Another thing that Blackboard is looking for is enhancing content with visual and auditory elements. So on this screen, I've just given some examples of some online educational video resources. I like videos. I think they um, capture attention. And I think uh, with a generation that's very big into social media, pictures, videos, video games, that, that might be very helpful with engaging students. So I just have a couple of examples here. Um, I'll just pull up one from TED-Ed. If you're not familiar with TED-Ed, they have really great educational videos. And this is, for example, if I was teaching a course on Alzheimer's disease, perhaps I want to show the students. This is, of course, not something that's required. It's just supplementary. But the student can view this on their own time. And maybe the concepts that we talk about in class, they'll understand a little bit better by seeing a video. Every four seconds, someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. 
It's the most common cause of dementia, affecting. Okay, I'm not going to go through the video. It's just to give you an idea of what the videos sort of look like in the website. And then I'm going to give you an example from the course that I'm developing. So in week two, one of the topics that we discuss is humanism, and one of the uh, other concepts that we discuss is empathy. We don't spend too much time on empathy, um, but uh, I put it as a resource if students want to get a better idea. There's a really great um, video that talks a lot about empathy and why it's important in healthcare. And I think it really drives home the point of putting yourself in a patient's shoes, knowing that everybody is coming from a different background, and um, just to be caring when you're caring for patients. Again, this isn't a nursing program. And again, I think there are certain things that you can see in a video that you, you, you can't really get maybe from reading a text or from reading lecture slides. Okay, again, so that was just an example. Moving forward, under course design is another section called learner engagement. So we want to engage our learners. Um, there, there is a thought that there are more students who drop out of online classes than in um, regular classes. There's a lot of uh, research that's contradictory to that. But even still, you want to make sure that your learners are engaged. It's a little bit more difficult because I can't see my students, I can't talk to them, I can't touch them. I need to be able to engage them somehow and ensure that they're engaged. So there's a couple of, there's lots of different activities that you can do. We just saw some great examples um, that I will definitely be linking to in my Blackboard course. Um, but these are some that I found online. Uh, for example, I'm teaching an anat anatomy and physiology course. I'm not really teaching an anatomy and physiology course. But if I was, this is a great online activity. Say we learned about the human body today. We learned about anatomy. Um, the students can go online. They can do this um, practice on their, own, on their own time. They can do it over and over again. So for example, I'm a student. My teacher has put this on as a resource for me. I need to know where is the head. Let me see, we talked about that in lecture today. Did she say mid? No, I don't think so, let me try again. Maybe it's around here? No, let me try again. And again, you can keep doing this continually until you get the right answer. And the students can continue to link to this as much as they want. It's a, 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 a learning activity that's not required, but will help the students. This is an example from my course that I'm developing. You can't read it very well, but what I've done for learner engagement is I use some icebreakers. Icebreakers are um, very highly encouraged in an online course. It's a way to get the students to get to know each other, for me to get to know the students, and for them to get to know me as well. So I do two types of icebreakers, a social and a cognitive. And this is from some... Um, Bocher and Conrad, that they have a, a text that talks about these things. Um, the social icebreaker, I have them create sort of a social media profile page. So it's something that's uh, a little bit more fun, a little bit more engaging. I have them develop a LinkedIn profile page. So a little bit more professional, not really like a Facebook or a Twitter or something like that. So they don't have to actually do this on LinkedIn. I'll just put the profile into Blackboard and they can include their information. So their, their name, if they want, if they choose to put a picture, and I put a disclaimer about putting a, a, a professional looking picture, uh, if they so choose, a summary, their work experience, background, and then something more related to the course, I have them talk about specific goals that they want to achieve by the end of the course, and to discuss excitement, challenges, um, any apprehensions they may have about the course, especially if this is their first time doing an online course. And then for the response part, for the students to read other people's profiles and then perhaps um, initiate a discussion with them. Perhaps um, two people have never taken an online course before, they can sort of commiserate on their own in this discussion. 
Um, and the second part is the uh, cognitive icebreaker. The cognitive icebreaker is really for me to get to know the students. And what I, have, what I will have them do is do an activity online, and it determines their learning style. So it helps me to see what way do they learn best, and helps them see what, what way they learn best as well. So it, it, it's like a survey, a questionnaire. They fill out some questions, and then at the end, it will tell them what type of learner they are, whether it's visual, auditory, or um, maybe they're more hands-on. And then I can use that information to sort of tailor the next few weeks of my content. If a lot of, if a lot of people are more hands-on, maybe I can um, do some more projects or group work or something like that. And also in adult education, it's very important for learners to know how they, how they learn because they want to be self-directed. They want to be able to, to um, move forward on their own. Okay, another section in course design is technology use. So obviously, especially in an online course, you want to be able to integrate different parts of technology. Sometimes students are very apprehensive because it looks very confusing, they're not really sure what to do. Um, but this is a really great, it's a very short video I'm going to show you about how easy it is to use some of these um, technologies within Blackboard. You don't even have to leave um, the Blackboard environment. While there are many tools available, we'll explore just a few to see the possibilities. All of these examples have a free version. You and your students can use Glogster to create digital posters that creatively express ideas with embedded images, podcasts, music, and video. Prezi allows you to evolve a standard slideshow into a wow presentation. You can have a canvas instead of a slide deck. You can zoom in to emphasize details and zoom out to see the big picture and how concepts relate to one another. Google Docs makes collaboration easy with a shared working space in documents, spreadsheets, and presentations. In addition, Google Sites enables you to create effective websites quickly. VoiceThread enables you to spark conversation around a shared object. It's a simple way to add verbal explanations to visual media. Comments can be added with a microphone, webcam, keyboard, or telephone. Users can also draw on the image while making comments. Jing enables you to take a picture or short narrated video of what you see on your computer monitor. You can save the capture locally or share on the web. All of these tools enable you to embed the content you create directly in your Blackboard course. So you can see, you can use these technologies right within Blackboard. They're very interactive, they're very interesting, they're very engaging. And we have a great IT department here that can help us with all of these things. So another section um, is, the, another major category is interaction and collaboration. And the first subcategory is communication strategies. This is very important, again, in an online community, you want to make sure that you're communicating with your students. Um, so one of the ways that you can communicate is synchronously. This is a little bit more challenging in an online environment because it is an asynchronous environment. But there are certain things that you can do to make it um, synchronous. So for example, um, this is an example I'm going to show you about using Blackboard Collaborate. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's, it's, um, it's like a Skype or a, some a type of uh, medium that you can um, do a, I'll just show you, it's easier to see it than for me to explain it. Oops. So welcome everyone, we're excited. I won't show you the video, I just want you to be able to see the screen. Um, you can see um, my right, your left, the top um, of the screen where the instructor or the person who is moderating this Blackboard Collaborate session is, that would be me. And I would be there, I can have a video of myself, 
you can turn the video off for people more like myself who are a little self-conscious, um, but you can still do the auditory portion without the video. You can see right under that, you can see who's participating. So that would be the students. You can see their names. And then underneath that, you'll see the chat box. And the chat box, the students can chat to each other. They can chat with me if they have a question. They can put it there so I can continuously monitor it and see if they're following along. And then the, the larger part of the screen is this whiteboard where you can type things, you can pull up lecture slides, anything really that you want. And I'm not sure if you can see up on the top of the left is my, my left is a recording button. So you can actually record this session for students who may not be able to participate um, at the same time, at the synchronous time, but they can view it later. I haven't used it yet, again, because I'm still developing my course, but what I'm planning to do is maybe make three synchronous um, events throughout the semester, maybe one per month, and maybe alternate the times, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the late evening, and send out some, some information to the students just to get some feedback on what times work best for them. And this is an example of where I might put um, the Blackboard Collaborate session. At the very bottom of the screen in the menus, you can see online meeting. So again, to make it seamless, to make it intuitive so students can find it very easily. And then, of course, there's asynchronous communication, which is the major way that we communicate online. And we can do this through various ways in Blackboard. One is through the use of announcements, which um, for my course is the home page. We'll take you straight there. And you can see, I put a screenshot here of when you're developing an announcement, you have the option to send an email out immediately. Um, so the student gets the, e the announcement right in their um, mailbox. Another section under interaction and collaboration is integration logistics. And this is really just to make sure that the students know what's expected of them in this course. So I put an example of using a rubric system so the students know exactly how do I get an A? How do I get a, well, I don't think they want to know how to get a B, really how to get an A, but shows them what expectations they should meet and what I'm expecting of them. And this is an example of what a colleague of mine has developed, Miriam Cadet. This is an example of how you can develop a rubric right within Blackboard. Blackboard has the ability to create a rubric system for you, and um, this is just an example of how you might put something like that together. So the next major category is assessment, and uh, the first subcategory is assessment design. And you can do your assessment any way that you choose. I put up some of the ways that I plan on using for my course. I'm going to do exams, reflection papers, activities, group presentations, and discussions. I'm probably going to do weekly exams, very, very low stakes, just to get an idea if the students are following along, if they're understanding the material. And that way, if I see that a large number of students are doing very poorly on a particular section, I can add maybe some more resources about some content that was covered that I think maybe students aren't really understanding. Under assessment is also self-assessment. So Blackboard really wants, if the students are, are struggling with a particular area, they can do assessments for themselves. So these are not graded. There are different things that the students can do on their own time. Um, perhaps something like uh, remedial activities, but something that they can self-direct themselves to. So I put an example of what one of my students came up with. This is something that you can do as an instructor, create your own, or the students can do it themselves. It's almost like a, a fun way of doing um, um, index cards. So, well, I guess it's more like a Jeopardy game. So I'll show you the students can develop this type of game online. And let's say they chose uh, 15 points. Um, this is on preeclampsia. So what is the management for a patient with mild preeclampsia and greater than 37 weeks gestation? You have a timer within which you have to give the answer. And then you can also view the answer. So the student can see whether they got this right or wrong. Again, you can develop this and um, of course, tailor it to your particular subject, and the students can go on and continue to do these over and over again. It's sort of like the anatomy um, activity that I showed you earlier. 
This one is a big one, orientation to the course in Blackboard. It's very important in that first week or that first two weeks to make sure that you grab the student's attention and that they're engaged. So having an orientation to the course in Blackboard is very, very important. Uh, I have a colleague, um, Betty Rambar, who had won um, a Sloan C Award for online, excellence in online education, and I'm gonna adapt some of her principles, and what she does is about three weeks before the class starts, she'll send out an email. Some students are very anxious, especially about something like an online course if they've never done it. They're a little anxious, they're not really sure what to expect, and some other students have a different concept of what an online course is, thinking maybe it's a little bit less work than a face-to-face than a -face course. So um, what she does is send out an email listing some expectations. For example, a three-credit course, you can expect to spend about nine to 12 hours um, on this course per week. So just making sure the students have a clear idea of what's expected, the exams, the, the discussion board, very, very briefly. And then one week before the class, um, she sends out a, a, a video tour of the Blackboard environment and a video orientation, so a video of the syllabus. Um, using the, the help and technology that we have here at Lehman College, I was also able to develop a video tour of my syllabus for students and was able to post it on the Blackboard environment, and that's what I've shown you a screenshot of here. I think it's really important and I think it's um, something that the students really appreciate, especially in an online environment so they know exactly what is expected of them throughout the course and how to navigate the Blackboard site because it can be a little bit intimidating if you've never used it before and even if you have used it before. Under learner support is also supportive software, and this might be, I might in, uh, include some of this in that first email that I sent to students, making sure they know if they have a Mac or a Windows computer or um, just certain things, like if there's a link to a video, it might take longer to download or might take longer to, to open up, um, and also to let them know if they are having trouble, who they can contact. Under learner support is also instructor role and information. Again, another very important part. The student needs to know that you're, that you're there, that your presence is there. So there is a section in Blackboard where you can um, create an instructor profile. I think it's a contact page. You can put a picture of yourself if you wish. You can, most importantly, you should put your contact information, how you can be contacted, the times that are good for you to be contacted. I put physical office hours and virtual office hours. And we'll see how virtual office hours works out for me this semester. But also letting students know that they can contact me by email anytime, but to also let them know what that response time might be, 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever um, you might expect, so students know that you actually did receive their email and that you are going to um, respond to them in a timely manner. Under learner support is also course institutional policies and support. So I might have links to something like our library, our academic support center, the student handbook, the nursing department homepage, and IT workshops that might be available for students, I think are some important things to have listed in there. Technical accessibility. Um, not all students have Microsoft Word. I'm mostly going to post things as a PDF because so, it seems a little bit more universal. Um, again, like I mentioned before, if, things, if I have a large posting and it's going to take a long time for students to download or for something to open, I might want to say that because, you know, they, you might just keep clicking on something and expecting it to open when it really takes a long time and then you have 20 pages of something open and who wants that, right? or a million emails about this isn't working, this isn't working. So you want to give some clear examples. Um, and again, like we said earlier, making it seamless, making it intuitive so students know where to find things very easily. Blackboard also wants to see that you're making accommodations for students who may have disabilities. So using um, different formatting, different colors, headings. If you have videos, um, to have a transcript of the video available so that students um, may be able to access that as well. And it doesn't have to be completely tailored. Blackboard just wants to see that you're making um, arrangements for, for, to accommodate people who may have disabilities in your course. Learning support and feedback. Again, 
feedback, very important in an online community. Students want to know that you're there, that you're reading what they're writing, that you're seeing what they're doing, and they want to hear what you have to say about it. Not just if it's bad, but if it's good things too. Um, you know, you're on the right track. Or even students who maybe do an exam just get maybe one wrong, just letting them, they, they want feedback on that one thing, especially things like a discussion board, um, showing that you're there in this discussion format. It's just not, it's not just the students talking to each other, it's them talking to each other and you um, overseeing it as well. And there's lots of um, resources for providing feedback to students. I, put an example here that I got from a great workshop that Lehman offers called, well CUNY offers, it's called The Art of Feedback. And um, this is based on Susan Coe's Feedback Bank, where she's got a bank of different feedbacks that you might give to students. Perhaps you've been teaching this course a long time, you know some common mistakes, you have a general um, feedback that you give to students so that it's consistent and, and it's appropriate. And it's easy for you as the instructor because you know you have a bank right here with everything that you might want to say to a student and you can just send it out that way. So that concludes my presentation, I, but I do want to take a minute to give a special thanks to people here at Lehman College who have greatly supported, supported um, my, my uh, work that I'm creating right now with this course. Um, some people also at the CUNY Graduate Center and at Hunter College. And I wanted to leave you with a quote that says, Live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever from Gandhi. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, I'm sorry. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any questions? Sure, you mean online versus um, physical. So it's, it's, it's complicated in certain areas. For something like uh, clinical skills, you have to have the student in a, in a hospital environment, and that will remain the same. Um, but it helps with a lot. There's so many resources online now. There's so many things you can refer to. And, right, and also at the Department of Nursing, there is a nursing arts lab where students can come in and um, use the equipment and develop skills as well. So I think with a combination of you being the instructor online, linking them to resources that are available to them, and them taking um, advantage of the opportunities that they have to actually come on campus if they can, um, works very well for them. And just as another caveat to that, the, the online program is an RN to BSN program, so these are students who are RNs already. They're registered nurses already, so they have most of the clinical skills. What we're giving them now is theory and content, so I, I don't foresee it to be a problem in this particular instance. Thank you.
Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's, there's many different ways to approach um, the discussion board. Um, and I started off the same way, grading the discussion board, and it's just endless. Um, so there's lots of different things you can do. If you're, uh, I grade my discussion board, um, but I found definitely some easier ways to do it. Um, so one thing that I did was I broke the students up into groups so that within their, so maybe there's five groups in the class, five people per group. and Within their group, they have their discussions, and they come up with one answer. And then each group would post their one answer in the main discussion board, and it just lightens the load for me of how much I'm reading and how much feedback I'm giving. And then also for each group, there is an identified person per week who is responsible for making that one post so that people know, okay, I'm not gonna wait for this person to do it or this person to do it. So they know exactly who's responsible for making that post. And it just makes life a little bit easier for them to maybe, you, now you can respond to group one or group two or group three or something. So that lightens the load a little bit. On the other hand, if you don't wanna grade your discussion board, some people are grading it in the way that they're just going on to make sure that you responded at least once or twice or three times or whatever, and you can grade it in that way too. Right, as a pass fail. Right. Yeah, there's this, um, one of the, that I mentioned earlier, the art of feedback. <laughs> you learn something new every time you do this, and apparently there's a way that you can click on, um, there's little boxes on the discussion board, and if you click all, and you open it that way, they will all load for you at once. So you can, so you can read them instead of going back and forth between them. Yeah, where you can open all of them. I haven't actually tried to give the feedback. I just thought that was wonderful instead of going back and having to open them all. But it's definitely um, something to look into. Any additional questions? So they do have to do some things that involve research, and for, for my course, APA format is required, and they also have to use references and resources. Um, so what I had done in the past is gone through the library showing them how to look up articles, um, how to search databases, and things like that, and I found that the library has a lot of um, links like that, sort of uh, tutorials maybe, to show the students how to use different um, resources. And I don't know, it seems like um, the, the information is there for the students to be able to access it. And I think having more resources available um, would definitely be helpful. You guys did a great presentation showing lots of links um, to resources that students are very easily able to access. So I think that, that something like that, having that as a resource would be very beneficial. Um, and I don't really see it being a too much of a, a, a barrier because um, I think even the students that I have in class face-to-face -face use more of the online references than physically going over to the library as well. Okay.
Thank you so much for, for your time, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak.